Start scheduling. The key to getting more free days and focus days in your life is to sit down and schedule them by jotting down how many focus days, buffer days, and free days you spend every month right now. You can work to increase the number of focus days and true 24-hour free days on your calendar and reduce the number of buffer days. With this kind of schedule, you'll find yourself creating greater results at work, enjoying more fulfillment in your personal life, and experiencing more balance between the two. Here are some other steps you might want to take to begin implementing the entrepreneurial time system. 1. List the three best focus days you have ever had. Write down any common elements. This will give you valuable clues as to how to create more perfect focus days. Plan for them. 2. Meet with your boss, staff, and coworkers to discuss how to create more focus days where you can focus 80% of your time on using your areas of brilliance to produce your best results. 3. Meet with your friends or family and discuss how to create more true free days in your life. 4. Schedule at least four vacations. They can be long weekends or longer for the next year. These can be as simple as a weekend camping trip, a weekend in San Francisco taking in the sights, a trip to the wine country, a weekend at the shore, a fishing trip, or a week visiting friends in a nearby state. Or it can include that dream of a lifetime vacation you have always wanted to take to California, Hawaii, Florida, Mexico, Europe, or Asia. If you don't plan it, it won't happen. So sit down and make a plan. 5. List the three best free days you have ever had and look for the common elements in those. Schedule more of those elements into your planned free days. As our world gets more complicated and more pressured, you will have to be increasingly more conscious and intentional to structure your time in a way that takes full advantage of your talents and maximizes your results and your income. Start now to control your time and your life. Remember, you are in charge. Principle 41 Build a powerful support team and delegate to them. The ascent of Everest was not the work of one day, nor even of those few unforgettable weeks in which we climbed. It is, in fact, a tale of sustained and tenacious endeavor by many over a long period of time. Sir John Hunt scaled Mount Everest in 1953. Every high achiever has a powerful team of key staff members, consultants, vendors, and helpers who do the bulk of the work while he or she is free to create new sources of income and new opportunities for success. The world's greatest philanthropists, athletes, entertainers, professionals, and others also have people who manage projects and handle everyday tasks, enabling them to do more for others, hone their craft, practice their sport, and so on. The Total Focus Process To help you clarify what you should be spending your time on and what you should be delegating to others, do the following exercise. Your goal is to find the top one, two, or three activities that best use your core genius, brings you the most money, and produce the greatest level of enjoyment. 1. Start by listing all those activities that occupy your time, whether they're business-related, personal, or related to your civic organizations or volunteer work. List even small tasks, such as returning phone calls, filing, or photocopying. 2. Next, choose from this list those one, two, or three things you are particularly brilliant at, your special and unique talents. Those things very few other people can do as well as you. Also choose from this list the three activities that generate the most income for you and your company. Any activities that you are brilliant at and that generate the most income for you and your company are the activities where you'll want to focus the most time and energy. 3. Finally, create a plan for delegating everything else to other people. Delegating takes time, training, and patience, but over time you can keep chipping away at the low-payoff, non-essential tasks on your list until you are doing less and less of those and more and more of what you are really good at. That is how you create a brilliant career. Seek out key staff members. 
If you're a business owner, and remember, becoming an entrepreneur early in life is one of those hallmarks of the most successful individuals throughout modern history. Start looking for key staff members now, or train your existing staff members on the tasks you identified above. If you're a one-person business, start looking for a dynamic number two person who could handle your projects, run your programs, book your sales transactions, and completely take over other tasks while you concentrate on what you do best. You can hire them outright as employees or have them work part-time on a contract basis as your company grows. I've seen many future achievers find a top-flight business manager months sooner than they expected, only to see their business grow exponentially once they made a deal to bring that person on board. Often you'll find that once you put the word out, the right person was already circulating in your universe. You just didn't know it. If philanthropic pursuits or community projects are your business, there are volunteers you can hire to help you. Consider college interns, who may work solely for class credit. We have several in our company. Or perhaps a local foundation can offer you staff support for your project. You never know until you ask. And if you are a stay-at-home mom or dad, your most valuable staff will be your house cleaner, the teenage helper down the street, your babysitter, and others who can help you get away for time by yourself and with your spouse. A neighbor or babysitter could also do grocery shopping, get your car washed, pick up the kids, or pick up the laundry and dry cleaning, all for $10 to $12 an hour. If you're a single parent, these folks are even more important to your successful future and should be chosen with great care. Why You Need Personal Advisors Our world has become a very complex place. Just filing your tax return, planning for retirement, rewarding your employees, even buying a home has become more complicated than ever. That's why every high achiever has a powerful team of personal advisors to turn to for assistance, advice, and support. In fact, this team is so critical. It pays to begin assembling the team early on in your success journey. Regardless of whether you own a business, work for someone else, or stay home and raise your children, you need personal advisors to answer questions, help you plan, ensure you make the most of life's efforts, and more. Your personal advisors can walk you through challenges and opportunities, saving you time, effort, and usually money. Your team of advisors should include your banker, your lawyers, a high net worth certified public accountant, your investment counselor, your doctor, nutritionist, personal trainer, and the leader of your religious organization. In fact, if you run a business, this principle takes on a whole new meaning. Too many business owners, for example, don't even have an accountant. They run their entire business on a computer program and never have any outside expert checking their numbers. They never form relationships with outside consultants who can free them up to pursue their core competency and help them grow. If you're a teenager or a college student, your team might be your parents, your best friends, your football coach, your counselor, people who believe in you. Often with teens, we find that their parents aren't really a part of their core group, but instead are part of the enemy. Sometimes this is the teen's perception, but sometimes it's actually the way things are. If your parents are dysfunctional, alcoholic, or abusive, or if they're simply not there because they're workaholics or divorced, you need a team of friends and other adults in your corner. Often it's a parent of another teen in your neighborhood. If you're a working mom, your core group should include a good babysitter or daycare provider. Not only should you investigate them thoroughly, but you should also have a backup resource. You should have a good pediatrician and dentist, too, plus others who can support you in raising healthy, happy children as you pursue your career. Athletes have their coterie of coaches, chiropractors, nutritionists, and performance consultants. They have, as part of their support team, people who specialize in designing diets for their body type and for their sport. They find trustworthy advisors and build and maintain those relationships over time. Once you determine who your members of this support team are, you can begin to build and nurture those relationships. Make sure team members are clear about what you expect from them and that you are clear about what they expect from you. Is this a paid relationship? What kind of working relationship is preferable? How can both of you be there when the other person needs you? 
How can team members help you grow and succeed? And finally, how can you keep in touch with them and best maintain this relationship? I recommend that you create a schedule of monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual meetings with every member of your team. Once you've chosen your team members, trust them. If you don't have an assistant, you are one. Raymond Aaron, author of Double Your Income, Doing What You Love. If you have chosen with care, you can begin to offload anything and everything that takes you away from focusing on your core genius, even personal projects. When Raymond Aaron sold his home and decided to move into an apartment, he delegated the entire project to his assistant. He told her to find a one-bedroom luxury apartment near his office with an exercise facility on the main floor. Find it, negotiate the lease, and bring me the contract to sign, he said. Then hire a moving van, get a check from my office to pay the movers, pack up the fragile items, supervise the movers, and drive behind them to my new home. He even had her hire an advanced cleaning crew, arrange the furniture with the movers, unpack boxes, put everything away, and call Raymond when the move was complete. And where was Raymond while his assistant was moving his house? On vacation in Florida. Though we often fear that if someone else performs tasks for us, the job won't be done as well. The reality is there are people who love to do what you hate to do, and they often do a much better job than you would or could yourself, at a cost that is much lower than you might think. In fact, thanks to modern technology, these people don't necessarily need to live nearby in order to help you. Numerous trustworthy websites such as Alance.com and Freelancer.com will connect you with virtual assistants and freelance professionals who can help you with a single project or ongoing work. Instead of working locally at your office or home, they work remotely and stay connected with you via email, telephone, Skype, or other digital means. What could a virtual assistant or virtual freelancer do for you? Write or edit reports, speeches, manuscripts, or proposals. Create a radio commercial, professionally record a telemarketing voice broadcast, or develop a YouTube video about your products or services. Do research of all kinds. Correct your vacation photographs using Adobe Photoshop, then compile them into a hardcover photo book at Shutterfly.com. Answer your telephone, handle your email, respond to your product inquiries, manage your social media, plus so much more. Additionally, micro-job websites such as FIVERR.com feature professionals who charge as little as $5 per project, a sum literally anyone can afford. There's no excuse anymore for doing everything yourself. Principle 42. Just say no. You don't have to let yourself be terrorized by other people's expectations of you. Sue Patton Foley, author of The Courage to Be Yourself. Our world is a highly competitive and overstimulating place, and more and more concentration is needed every day just to stay focused on completing your daily tasks and pursuing your longer-term goals. Because of the explosion of communications technology, we are more accessible to more people than ever before. Complete strangers can reach you by telephone, cell phone, text, fax, regular mail, email, and social media. They can reach you at home, at work, and on your smartphone. If you're not there, they can leave messages on your answering machine or your voicemail. If you are there, they can interrupt you with call waiting. It seems everyone wants a piece of you. Your kids want rides or to borrow the car. Your co-workers want your input on projects that are not your responsibility. Your boss wants you to work overtime to finish a report he needs. Your sister wants you to take her kids for the weekend. Your child's school wants you to be a driver for next week's field trip. And your mother wants you to come over and fix her screen door. Your best friend wants to talk about his impending divorce. And a local charity wants you to head up the annual luncheon committee. And an endless array of telemarketers want you to subscribe to the local newspaper, contribute to the nearby wildlife sanctuary, or transfer all of your credit card debt over to their new card. Even your pets are clamoring for more attention. We suffer under project and productivity overload at work, 
taking on more than we can comfortably deliver in an unconscious desire to impress others, get ahead, and keep up with others' expectations. Meanwhile, our top priorities go unaddressed. To be successful in achieving your goals and creating your desired lifestyle, you will have to get good at saying no to all of the people and distractions that would otherwise devour you. Successful people know how to say no without feeling guilty. To them, no is a complete sentence. Don't just delegate. Eliminate. If you're going to increase your results and your income, as well as increase the amount of free days in your life, you're going to have to eliminate those activities, requests, and other time-stealers that don't have a high payoff. You will have to structure your work so that you are focusing your time, effort, energies, and resources only on projects, opportunities, and people that give you a huge reward for your efforts. You're going to have to create strong boundaries about what you will and won't do. Start by creating what Jim Collins, author of Good to Great, calls a stop-doing list. Most of us are busy but undisciplined. We are active but not focused. We are moving, but not always in the right direction. By creating a stop-doing list as well as a to-do list, you bring more discipline and focus into your life. Write your stop-doing list as soon as possible. Then make the things on your list policies. People respond to policies. They understand a policy as a boundary. They will respect you more for being clear about what you won't do. For example, some of my don't-do policies are... I don't give endorsements for books of fiction. I don't schedule more than five talks in one month. I no longer co-author books with first-time authors. Their learning curve is too time-consuming and expensive. I don't take any calls on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those are writing or product development days. I don't lend my books to other people. They rarely come back, and they are the source of my livelihood, so I don't lend them out. I don't lend money. I am not a bank. I don't discuss charitable contributions over the phone. Send me something in writing. If saying no is so important, then why is it so hard to say? Why do we find it so hard to say no to everybody's requests? As children, many of us learned that no was an unacceptable answer. Responding with no was cause for discipline. Later in our careers, no may have been the reason for a poor evaluation, or failing to move up the corporate ladder. Yet highly successful people say no all the time, to projects, to crazy deadlines, to questionable priorities, and to other people's crises. In fact, they view the decision to say no as equally acceptable as the decision to say yes. Others say no, but will offer to refer you to someone else for help. Still others claim their calendar, family obligations, deadlines, and even finances are reasons why they must decline requests. At the office, achievers find other solutions to their co-workers' repeated emergencies. Rather than become a victim of someone else's lack of organization and poor time management, it's not against you. It's for me. One response that I have found helpful in saying no to crisis appeals or time-robbing requests from people is, it's not against you, it's for me. When the local PTA chairman calls with yet another weekend fundraising event that needs your dedication, you can say, you know, my saying no to you is not against you or what you are trying to accomplish. It's a very worthy cause, but recently I realized I've been overcommitting myself outside my home. So even though I support what you are doing, the fact is I've made a commitment to spend more time with my family. It's not against you. It's for us. Few people can get angry at you for making and standing by this higher commitment. In fact, they'll probably respect you for your clarity and your strength. There are lots of valuable techniques you can learn that will make it easier to say no without feeling guilty. I recommend you read one of the several good books that address this issue in greater depth than I have space for here. The two best books are When I Say No, I Feel Guilty by Manuel J. Smith and How to Say No Without Feeling Guilty by Patty Brightman and Connie Hatch. Say no to the good so that you can say yes to the great. Good is the enemy of great. 
Jim Collins, author of Good to Great, Build to Last, and Great by Choice. What a simple concept this is, yet you'd be surprised how frequently even the world's top entrepreneurs, professionals, educators, and civic leaders get caught up in projects, situations, and opportunities that are merely good, while the great is left out in the cold, waiting for them to make room in their lives. In fact, concentrating on merely the good often prevents the great from showing up, simply because there's no time left in our schedules to take advantage of any additional opportunity. Is this your situation? Constantly chasing after mediocre prospects or pursuing misguided schemes for success when you could be holding at bay opportunities for astounding achievement? The Pareto Principle When 20% equals 80% if you surveyed your life and jotted down those activities that brought you the most success, the most financial gain, the most advancement, and the most enjoyment, you would discover that about 20% of your activity produces about 80% of your success. This phenomenon is the basis for the Pareto Principle, often referred to as the Law of the Vital Few, named after the 19th century economist who discovered that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. Later, researchers discovered that 80% of an enterprise's revenue usually comes from 20% of its customers. Stop majoring in the minors. Instead of dedicating yourself and your time to mundane, non-productive, time-stealing activity, imagine how rapidly you would reach your goals and improve your life if you said no to those time-wasting activities and instead focused on the 20% of activity that would bring you the most benefit. What if instead of watching television, mindlessly surfing the Internet, running unnecessary errands, and addressing problems you could have avoided in the first place, you used the extra time to focus on your family, your marriage, your business, your breakthrough goal, starting a new income stream, or other more productive activities? Sylvester Stallone's Rocky Beginning Sylvester Stallone knows how to say no to the good. After finishing the very first Rocky screenplay, Stallone encountered several producers who were interested in making it into a movie. But even though that alone would have made Stallone a lot of money, he insisted on playing the lead role, too. Even though other actors such as James Caan, Ryan O'Neill, and Burt Reynolds were considered to play Rocky Balboa, Stallone said no, and after finding backers willing to finance a shoestring budget of under $1 million, Stallone completed filming on location in just 28 days. Rocky went on to become the sleeper hit of 1976, earning over $225 million and garnering Oscars for Best Picture and Best Director, as well as acting and writing nominations for Stallone, who took full charge of his golden opportunities and turned Rocky Balboa, and later John Rambo, into industry franchises that have grossed over $2 billion in revenues worldwide. What could show up in your life if you said no to the good? How can you determine what's truly great so you can say no to what's merely good? 1. Start by listing your opportunities, one side of the page for good and the other side for great. Seeing options in writing will help crystallize your thinking and determine what questions to ask, what information to gather, what your plan of attack might be, and so on. It'll help you decide if an opportunity truly fits with your overall life purpose and passion, or if it's just life taking you down a side road. 2. Talk to advisors about this potential new pursuit. People who have traveled the road before you have vast experience to share and hard-headed questions to ask about any new opportunity you might be contemplating. They can talk to you about expected challenges and help you evaluate the cost factor, that is, how much time, money, effort, stress, and commitment will be required. 3. Test the waters. Rather than just take a leap of faith that the new opportunity will proceed as you expect, Conduct a small test, spending a limited amount of time and money. If it's a new career you're interested in, first seek part-time work or independent consulting contracts in that field. If it's a major move or volunteer project you're excited about, 
See if you can travel for a few months to your dream locale, or find ways to immerse yourself in the volunteer work for several weeks before committing 100%. 4. And finally, look at where you spend your time. Determine if those activities truly serve your goals, or if saying no would free up your schedule for more focused pursuits. Principle 43. Become a leader worth following. The most dangerous leadership myth is that leaders are born, that there is a genetic factor to leadership. That's nonsense. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are made rather than born. Warren Bennis, founding chairman of the Leadership Institute at the University of Southern California. Whether you own a business, teach school, manage a small group, coach an athletic team, or are working to advance a worthwhile cause, you need to enroll others in order to achieve the success you want. This not only requires you to hold a vision of what success is, it also requires you to practice leadership skills that will inspire others to want to help you reach that goal. Because our success often requires the help of others, successful people, not surprisingly, are also successful leaders. They know how to communicate their vision in exciting and compelling terms. They've mastered the skill of motivating others to jump on board with full commitment. They recognize potential in their people, coach their team members to go above and beyond, and routinely acknowledge others' positive contribution. And while great leaders must demand accountability from the people they lead, they also hold themselves accountable for their contribution to the result. In the process of leading, great leaders also transform their followers. They stimulate and inspire others to deliver extraordinary outcomes, of course. But they also help these followers develop and grow into leaders themselves. That's the true definition of great leadership. Exceptional leaders aren't born that way. They become exceptional by developing a unique set of attitudes and skills that are both learnable and teachable. Why become a leader? Becoming a leader gives you the opportunity to magnify your impact in the world. It allows you to leverage the hearts and actions of others toward the achievement of goals and objectives that you care about. It allows you to produce bigger results faster than you could ever do on your own. And while not all destined to become leaders are on a level with John F. Kennedy, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Steve Jobs, or Mother Teresa, we can all learn to develop our leadership skills for positive impact in our organizations and our local communities. In fact, knowing how to be an effective leader will make you more successful in any role, whether you are climbing the corporate ladder, building a network marketing downline, working as a social change agent, coaching a little league team, volunteering for a civic group, or simply organizing a church event. So let's take a look at some of the basics of becoming the kind of leader whom people will want to work with and follow. Become the kind of leader that people would follow voluntarily, even if you had no title or position. Brian Tracy, author of Maximum Achievement and The Ultimate Success Guide. Behavior number one. Know your own strengths and weaknesses. One of the most distinguishing qualities of a great leader is their dedication to understanding themselves. When you have a clear sense of who you are, your strengths and weaknesses, and know the impact your behavior has on others, your ability to lead others will improve. For one thing, self-awareness lets you be realistic about your ability to contribute or detract from the outcome of a project. If you know you are not the best graphic designer, for example, why impose your ideas on the company's brochure or website? especially when you could easily empower and rely on others to do this job better than you. Or if keeping your people accountable to meeting deadlines seems like a constant headache, especially on top of your own duties, why not put systems in place that do the follow-up and reporting for you, such as weekly accountability meetings, project management software, calendar reminders, and more? And if you are shy, introverted, or downright fearful about negotiating anything— why not delegate that to people who love the game of bargaining for a great deal? In fact, just as there are things you hate to do or aren't good at, there are people who love these tasks and are good at them because it's their passion. 
Knowing your strengths and weaknesses gives you the ability to discern when your skills will add value or not, and keeps you open to delegating and listening to people with other points of view. Not only does this allow lots of creative ideas to emerge from your team, it simply makes your work easier because you'll never have to struggle with tasks you shouldn't be doing in the first place. Knowing your own strengths and weaknesses also helps you to keep your emotions in check during times of intense pressure or crisis. Self-awareness ensures you won't get swept away in the emotion of a situation. Rather, you'll be able to respond with clear, compassionate, and fearless action. And by remaining calm, you also create a sense of safety for others, especially in times of crisis or rapid change. All good leaders possess a heightened sense of awareness, an ability to read situations in which they find themselves and act accordingly. Great leaders take this one step further. They are not only aware, they are also self-aware. Les McKeown, author of Predictable Success, Getting Your Organization on the Growth Track and Keeping It There. Of course, the key to being self-aware as a leader is your willingness to be wrong, to not know everything, to recognize that you have certain biases, and to see where your opinions may be simply getting in the way. No one has all the answers and great leaders admit there is always plenty to learn. They also listen to feedback. In fact, great leaders know that when you are willing to admit your own mistakes and genuinely listen to critical feedback without rationalizing, justifying, or placing blame, you get to turn these moments into learning opportunities for yourself and teachable moments for your team. Instead of battles, you create more open and collaborative culture amongst your team members, without the pressure or fear of anyone pretending to know it all. This kind of authenticity and transparency ultimately gives others permission to be open about their weaknesses, fears, and learning needs, too. No one will misrepresent their abilities to you once you set a standard for openness. Behavior number two. Hold yourself accountable. And others, too. Essential to your success in leading others is a commitment to taking 100% responsibility for your own actions and results. When you consistently follow through on your own commitments, you begin to build others' trust in your leadership. To be trusted, you must be reliable, punctual, and a person who keeps your agreements. Do you arrive at meetings on time? Do you deliver your part of projects completed and on deadline? Do you abide by promises made to your team members and others? Do you react in the same steady manner to every crisis? Do you soberly consider new opportunities in light of goals your team is already working on? These are the hallmarks of a leader who is responsible and consistent versus one who is perpetually late, unprepared, emotionally or continually led astray by the latest fad. Of course, no one is perfect, including leaders. But while perfection might be desirable, consistency will be far more impactful because it builds integrity and reliability with your team. It makes you a trustworthy leader. Naturally, there will be times when you fall short on your promises or are unable to keep an agreement. In such cases, acknowledge your shortcomings to the team members involved and make plans to fix the problem, a move which will help you grow in integrity as a leader. Taking 100% responsibility also extends to situations that do not turn out as planned, but that were under your control. In such cases, don't blame others for disappointing outcomes that you were in charge of or could have prevented. Instead, be accountable, reflect, learn, and adjust your behavior so you can take responsibility for what happens next. If you blame others for missed targets or other failures of leadership— you will not only damage the trust of your team, you'll substantially reduce your personal power. In addition to taking responsibility for your part of bad outcomes, you must have the courage to hold others accountable for their actions and results. Accountability is a major factor in whether people feel empowered, perform effectively, take initiative, and act responsibly. But when people on your team are not creating the results you want, you must have the courage to confront what isn't working and engage the people involved in what can be a difficult and uncomfortable conversation about accountability and getting back on track with the goal.
Don't shy away from these difficult conversations. Instead, have the courage to hold people accountable for their results. Behavior number three. Inspire your team with a clear, compelling, and continuous vision. The very essence of leadership is that you have to have a vision. It's got to be a vision you articulate clearly and forcefully on every occasion. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet. Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, President Emeritus of the University of Notre Dame. To inspire others to work tirelessly to help accomplish your goal, you must first have a clear and compelling vision of the future. What will you and your team ultimately achieve? By when? What will everyone gain when the goal is reached? Is it honorable, beneficial, ethical, and uplifting? What's so compelling about it? What else will also be achieved as your team is striving for this major goal? To get other people's buy-in, you'll also need to articulate who your team will become as they learn and grow on the path to achieving your vision. Your team must be able to see themselves in the future as better, smarter, stronger, more valued, and more confident. Defining that outcome, plus other benefits people will experience, is an important part of your clear and compelling vision. Secondly, your belief in the vision must be unshakable. That means that you must believe it's not only possible, but also desirable, essential, and inevitable. This kind of belief in your vision is simply a choice. You just choose to believe it, and then communicate it with certainty. President John F. Kennedy had a vision of the United States putting a man on the moon by the end of the decade, 1970. Nelson Mandela had a vision of a South Africa without apartheid. Mahatma Gandhi had a vision of India without British rule achieved with nonviolence. Aung San Suu Kyi, an opposition leader in her home country of Myanmar, Burma, and the winner of the 1991 Nobel Prize for Peace, had a vision of her country governed by a democratically elected civilian government, rather than a military dictatorship. And in the world of business, Bill Gates had a vision of a personal computer in every home and on every desk. Steve Jobs, creator of the iPod and iTunes, had a vision of revolutionizing the music industry and making it easy to download single songs— and put 1,000 songs in your pocket. Sarah Blakely, the billionaire founder of Spanx, when she was going door-to-door -door selling fax machines in her 20s, had a visions of being the rich owner of Spanx, manufacturing and selling more comfortable and attractive hosiery products for women. Every one of these great leaders communicated their vision with passion and conviction. You, too, must be able to tell the story of your vision so convincingly that it captures the imagination, hearts, and hands of others. Your words must communicate the certainty of the goal, which will carry your team when they lose confidence in themselves and the process. You must also bring to the discussion your own natural passion and enthusiasm for the goal, something that cannot be faked and which is highly contagious. One book that will help you tell powerful, compelling stories ones that communicate your vision and enroll the people you need to achieve it, is Tell to Win, Connect, Persuade, and Triumph with the Hidden Power of Story by Peter Goober, former president of Sony Pictures Entertainment, whose films have earned 50 Academy Award nominations and generated more than $3 billion worldwide. Not surprisingly, Goober says... The most successful companies and initiatives are built when leaders form personal and emotional connections with employees, partners, customers, volunteers, and suppliers who can help. Stories about your vision, your products, and even yourself produce the deep emotional reaction that is so important in creating a bond with others. Behavior number four. Listen for possibility. Once people are enrolled in the vision, a great leader will listen to his team, not only to hear their thoughts and input, but also to make sure they feel heard. People want to know they make a difference and that their insights and opinions matter. When you develop your listening skills, you'll be more present in the moment. You'll be curious to hear other options. You'll be able to truly hear what emerges from a discussion. And you'll be open to a true dialogue with your team. 
instead of simply delivering orders or explaining the game plan. This requires a willingness to be transformed by what you hear. But more important, it requires you to shift your focus from listening for the right way or the wrong way to listening for what is possible. I call this listening for possibility. There is no question that our culture rewards great speakers, people who can inspire and command an audience. But while being a passionate speaker can be a valuable skill, in the long run, effective listening may be a more valuable skill for leaders. In a meeting when you're talking, you're merely repeating or reporting what you already know. Nothing new is created. But when you listen intently, you can co-create new approaches, new outcomes, and new benefits from the ideas that you hear. If you find yourself formulating a response or improving on someone's idea while they are speaking, learn to be patient. Stop and truly listen, and let new possibilities emerge. People don't need to be managed. They need to be unleashed. Richard Florida director of the Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. One of my early models for effective leadership was Dr. Billy Sharp, the president of the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation, where I worked when I was 26. I admired his commitment to always be learning, his willingness to listen to the input of others, and his commitment to empower everyone on the staff to do the same. He always asked, what do you think? What would you do? Why? I vividly remember one day being asked to sit in on a meeting Dr. Sharp had scheduled with an expert on values. He knew that several of us had read this man's books and were interested in his work. Being only 26 at the time, it was a great thrill to be invited to sit in on a meeting with the president of the foundation and this well-known expert. When the three-hour meeting was over and everyone else had left the room, I said to Dr. Sharp, You asked this man question after question for several hours, and you never once talked about your research or the work we were doing here at the Foundation. How come? He answered, I already know what I know. I wanted to learn what he knew. That was a pivotal moment in my learning to be a better leader. It isn't about impressing others with how much I know. Ask more questions. Listen to everybody. Look for the underlying themes and patterns. Dr. Sharp taught me that it takes input from a lot of people to see the whole truth of any situation, to value curiosity, to be open to being changed during a dialogue, and to honor and appreciate everybody for their input. Dr. Sharp communicated his belief in our ability to contribute by intently listening to each of our perspectives. He truly cared about our point of view. And because we felt valued, we always tried to do our best, to be worthy of his trust in us. As a result, he got our best efforts. Another reason to listen intently is that you'll often hear a story behind the story. That is, people's fears, insecurities, even judgments. When people feel they're not being heard, or their true concerns are not being addressed, resentment builds to the point where people can become toxic to the rest of the team. While hearing the real story often takes empathy, an essential leadership skill, you should also listen for tension, disappointment, or indifference. Great leaders address these real problems as quickly as possible, which results in more committed and more engaged people working on your cause. Behavior number five. Coach others to take a leadership role. The most essential work of the leader is to create more leaders. Mary Parker Follett, social worker and pioneer in organizational theory and behavior. As a leader today, you will face increasing levels of uncertainty and complexity. That's just how the world works. You can't possibly know or control everything. So one way to overcome this is to coach your people to take a leadership role in their part of the project. Instead of simply directing a preset plan, Coaching people into action and helping them develop their own leadership skills means not only that you get to share the decision-making, but also that you build a team of smart, self-confident, and self-directed people who can respond quickly to changing conditions and circumstances. Growing a team of your own top-notch leaders simply makes your life easier. 
And the most useful skill for growing other leaders is coaching. Through deep listening and skillful questioning, you can help others discover their own solutions to problems and opportunities. Instead of being the only person figuring out what to do next, when you use coaching to help others develop their own solutions, you are also helping them develop their own problem-solving skills. To any leader who has been bombarded with the simplest and most mundane problems to solve, this idea of empowering your people with their own leadership skills will be a relief. So how can you coach your people to become leaders in their own right? Start by asking your people to correctly define the problem. This gets them fully engaged in the process and helps them take ownership of the problem as one they need to solve. Studies show that once a problem or challenge is theirs, it will be solved more efficiently and stay solved longer if you allow your team to create the solution. You provide direction only when they have reached the limits of their experience or training. Give people the tools and information they need to solve problems. Then let them stretch. One example of a series of coaching questions I often use with my people is something I call the difficult or troubling situation exercise. You'll find this exercise in my book, Coaching for Breakthrough Success, Proven Techniques for Making Impossible Dreams Possible, by Jack Canfield and Dr. Peter Chi. 1. What is a difficult or troubling situation you are dealing with? 2. How are you creating or allowing it to happen? 3. What are you pretending not to know? 4. What is the payoff for keeping it like it is? 5. What would you rather be experiencing? 6. What actions will you take to create that? 7. By when will you take that action? Here's an example of what this series of questions might produce. 1. What is a difficult or troubling situation you are dealing with? Everyone seems to always come late to the meetings I run. 2. How are you creating or allowing it to happen? I have not made it clear that it is important to start on time. I usually wait for the people who are late to arrive so that the people who are there on time don't see any reason to be on time, so they start coming late too. 3. What are you pretending not to know? That people are not going to take the starting time seriously if I don't. 4. What is the payoff for keeping it like it is? I don't have to confront anyone about being late. I get to complain about how it is their fault. 5. What would you rather be experiencing? Getting the meeting started on time with a lot of positive energy? 6. What actions will you take to create that? I'll send a memo stating that from now on we will start on time. I'll find a way to reward people for being on time by showing a funny video from YouTube, maybe having a drawing for a $50 bill right at the beginning of the meeting for anyone who is on time. Make it fun and exciting to show up on time. 7. By when will you take that action? I'll write the memo today and have a drawing for a $50 bill at the next meeting. This is just one example of the kind of questions that gets people to take more responsibility for how they have created or allowed an unsatisfactory situation and how they can create more of what they want. Ken Blanchard, author of The One-Minute Manager Meets the Monkey, writes that leaders often become overwhelmed by monkeys on their back, that is, projects and problems that don't belong to them. When a team member comes to you with a problem and you agree to do something about it, the monkey is off their back and onto yours. You've suddenly taken ownership of the problem. Don't let this be your outcome. Coach your people to develop their own problem-solving and leadership skills instead, and let them solve more problems, thereby creating more time and space for you to focus on what you need to do to accomplish your vision. Behavior number six. Maintain an attitude of gratitude. Whether you are leading a team of executives, athletes, community volunteers, school parents, or family game night, everyone needs to be acknowledged for what they do and who they are. Practicing gratitude and acknowledging others is the easiest way for a leader to build trust, enthusiasm, 
and commitment in those around you. Numerous studies indicate that 80% of employees report that they are motivated to work harder when their employer shows appreciation for their work, while only 17% of people feel they are appreciated enough by their boss. And more than 50% of people would stay longer at their job if they felt more appreciation from their manager or boss. So whether or not you feel you're too busy, too uncomfortable, or too unappreciated yourself, you need to schedule time and build in systems and rituals to appreciate people more often and more consistently. See Principle 53, Practice Uncommon Appreciation, for details on how to more effectively appreciate people both at home and at work. Developing an attitude of gratitude and appreciating the people you lead returns tremendous benefits. Scientists are now documenting the health benefits from practicing gratitude and are finding that those who consistently acknowledge and thank others have lower levels of stress, are more optimistic, and are less frequently drawn into anger, bitterness, and frustration. Gratitude and appreciation improves mood, makes you feel lighter, and helps you experience less stress. You simply cannot hold negative and positive emotions at the same time. Those around you will enjoy the same positive benefits, resulting in increased motivation, more involvement, and greater commitment to your project or cause. So don't underestimate the power of a simple thank you in every part of your life, be it at the dinner table or in the boardroom. My friend and co-author of The Power of Focus, Les Hewitt, carries note cards with him at all times, then writes a sentence or two of appreciation or acknowledgement whenever he encounters extraordinary service or meets a valuable new business contact. He even carries postage stamps with him so that his note is often waiting for the new acquaintance upon their return to their office. Begin cultivating your attitude of gratitude, and over time you'll not only transform your perspective, but you'll also attract other like-minded, optimistic people into your life and your circle of influence. Principle 44 Create a network of mentors and others who will up-level you. Study anyone who's great, and you'll find that they apprentice to a master or several masters. Therefore, if you want to achieve greatness, renown, and superlative success, you must apprentice to a master. Robert Allen, self-made multimillionaire and co-author of The One Minute Millionaire. Despite some of the best information available on how to accomplish any task, most people still tend to ask their friends, neighbors, co-workers, and siblings for advice on key issues they may be facing. Too often, they ask the advice of others who have never triumphed over the specific hardship they are facing, or who have never succeeded in their specific area of endeavor. As I pointed out in Principle 9, success leaves clues. Why not take advantage of all the wisdom and experience that already exists by finding a mentor or two, or three, who have already been down the road you want to travel. All you have to do is ask. One of the main strategies of the successful is that they constantly seek out guidance and advice from experts in their field. Set aside some time and make a list of the people you would like to ask to mentor you. Then approach them and ask for their help. Determine in advance what you want from a mentor. Though it may seem daunting at first to contact successful people and ask for ongoing advice and assistance, it is easier than you think to enlist the mentorship of those who are far ahead of you in the areas in which you'd like to succeed. What mentors do more than anything, says famed speaker and best-selling author Les Brown, is help you see possibilities. In other words, mentors help you overcome possibility blindness, both by acting as a role model for you and by conveying a certain level of expectation as they communicate with you. When Les started his speaking career in the early 1980s, he sent a cassette tape of his earliest keynote speech to the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the world-renowned speaker and publisher of Guideposts magazine. That cassette tape led to a long and fruitful relationship for Les, as Dr. Peale not only took Les under his wing and counseled him on his speaking style, but also quietly opened doors and helped Les get important speaking engagements. 
Suddenly, though Les was a virtual unknown on the circuit, speakers' bureaus began calling him for bookings, even raising his rate to $5,000 per speech from the modest $700 Les had been charging. As Les recounts the story, Norman Vincent Peale was the first person to tell Les he could make it big in the speaking industry. He spoke more to my heart than to my mind, said Les. While I was doubting myself, my abilities, my lack of education, and my background, Dr. Peel said, You have the right stuff. You have everything it takes. Just continue to speak from your heart, and you will do well. That's when Les realized the value of having a mentor. And though their relationship consisted only of brief phone conversations, and Les is occasionally trailing after Dr. Peel to learn his speaking style, in the end it meant more to both men than they knew at the time. During his last public speech at age 95, Dr. Peel used one of his protégé's oft-repeated phrases, Shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Perhaps, like Les, you just need someone to open doors for you. Or perhaps you need a referral to a technical expert who can help you build a new service for your company. Maybe you simply need validation that the path you're choosing is the right one. A mentor can help you with all of these things, but you need to be prepared to ask for specific advice. Do your homework. One of the easiest ways to research the names and backgrounds of people who have been successful in your area of interest is to read industry magazines, search the Internet, ask trade association executive directors, attend trade shows and conventions, call fellow entrepreneurs, or approach others who operate in your industry or profession. Look for mentors who have the kind of well-rounded experience you need to tackle your goal. When you start seeing a pattern of the same few people being recommended, you know you've identified your short list of possible mentors. Janet Switzer regularly mentors people on how to grow their business. When Lisa Miller of CRA Management Group called Janet, she was just about to sign away a large percentage of her revenues to someone she thought would help her develop a new area of her business. Janet showed Lisa how to instantly accomplish the same goal without outside parties, and even helped her land new business from existing clients, accelerating Lisa's company growth plan by four months and earning her hundreds of thousands of extra dollars. To contact possible mentors like Janet and ensure a successful conversation once you do, make a list of specific points you'd like to cover in your first conversation, such as why you'd like them to mentor you, and what kind of help you might be looking for. Be brief, but be confident, too. The truth is that successful people like to share what they have learned with others. It is a human trait to want to pass on wisdom. Not everyone will take the time to mentor you, but many will, if asked. You simply need to make a list of the people you would like to have as your mentor and ask them to devote a few minutes a month to you. Some will say no, but some will say yes. Keep asking people until you get a positive response. Les Hewitt, who founded the Achievers Coaching Program, coached the owner of a small trucking company who wanted to ask one of the major players in the trucking industry to be his mentor. The mentor was delighted to be asked, and he ended up helping the young man's company grow exponentially. His original script is one you might imitate. Hello, Mr. Johnston. My name is Neil. We haven't met yet. And I know you're a busy man, so I'll be brief. I own a small trucking business. Over the years, you have done a fantastic job building your business into one of the largest companies in our industry. I'm sure you had some real challenges when you were first starting out. Well, I'm still in those early stages trying to figure everything out. Mr. Johnston, I would really appreciate if you would consider being my mentor. All that would mean is spending ten minutes on the phone with me once a month so I could ask you a few questions. I'd really appreciate it. Would you be open to that? If you are a small business owner or are contemplating starting a business, you should contact your local chapter of SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives. Working in partnership with the U.S. Small Business Administration, SCORE is an extensive national network of over 11,000 retired and working volunteers, providing free business counseling and advice 
as well as low-cost workshops as a public service to all types of businesses, in all stages of development, from idea to startup to success. You can find one of their 320 chapter offices at www.score.org. Another source of free business advice and counseling for small business owners is Small Business Development Centers, a service of the U.S. Small Business Administration. They have 63 offices across the country waiting to serve you. Find out more at www.sba.gov forward slash SBDC.